continues. The president of the United States is racist. You could be the leader of the neo-Nazi racism with steroids. Our president is a clear and present danger to non-white people in America. It's that simple. Can the president flip the script? We are all created equal by God. Restart immigration talks and avoid a showdown over a government shutdown before funding runs out one week from tonight. We just have to get it done. And Ed Henry has exclusive new reporting on alleged abuse of government surveillance programs by the FBI and Justice Department. And in night courts, a cruise line lands itself in hot water after sailing through the icy waters of the bomb cyclone. Can you sue for being seasick? Welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. New tonight, we're hearing at this late hour that the president is reportedly making a flurry of calls to friends and outside advisors to get their reaction to the firestorm, what some are calling the S storm over the S hole comment. He's now in the Winter White House, his Mar-a-Lago estate, reportedly defending his remarks in those calls about Haiti, El Salvador, and African nations, saying he's just expressing what many people think but won't say publicly about troubled countries with high rates of emigration to the U.S. The report says President Trump is not apologetic tonight. He denies he is a racist, and he's blaming the media for distorting what he said. With that, let's bring in our Garrett Tenney with more. Good evening, Garrett. Well, Shannon, President Trump continues to deny that he made disparaging remarks about Haitians and Africans during a meeting in the Oval Office yesterday, but there is no denying that his comments have become a major distraction for this administration, which is in the midst of delicate negotiations on immigration and trying to find a way to avoid a government shutdown. That was clear throughout the day as world leaders reacted to the president balking at a proposed plan for the U.S. to allow more immigrants from countries like Haiti, El Salvador, and African nations, calling them whole countries. And at a White House event today, after signing a proclamation for Martin Luther King Day, President Trump ignored questions from the press about his statements. We hope he didn't say those things. If he did, we just hope he apologized, not just to the Haitian community, but to the American people. These are shocking and shameful comments from the President of the United States. I'm sorry, but there's no other word one can use but racist. Ours is not a whole country, neither is Haiti or any other country in distress. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate that he makes those statements. As we reported last night, multiple sources inside and outside the White House confirmed to us that the president did use that disparaging language during his meeting with lawmakers on immigration. But today, President Trump denied it, tweeting, the language used by me at the DACA meeting was tough, but this was not the language used. Now, two GOP senators who were in the meeting also issued a statement today saying they don't recall hearing the president make those specific comments either. But bigger than the he said, she said, the White House is in the midst of its efforts to broker a deal between Democrats and Republicans on DACA. And leaders in both parties today acknowledged the fallout from the president's remarks isn't making those negotiations any easier. Yeah, I, I read those comments later last night. Uh, so first thing that came to my mind was very unfortunate, um, unhelpful. You've seen the comments in the press. I have not read one of them that's inaccurate. And congressional leaders are still optimistic they will be able to reach a deal that addresses both DACA and border security. There is a new bipartisan group of four top lawmakers from the House and the Senate that's working to sort through all the ideas that are out there to see if they can come up with a deal that will pass muster with Congress as well as the White House. Shannon. That's going to be a tough climb. All right, Garrett Tenney, thank you very much. New tonight, House Democrats want to censure the president over this whole discussion. Democratic Congressman Cedric Richmond and Jerry Nadler saying these remarks have compelled us to prepare a resolution of censure with our colleagues next week to condemn President Trump for his racist statements. Republican Senator Johnny Isaacson from Georgia was not in the meeting, but says this, quote, that's not the kind of statement the leader of the free world should make and he ought to be ashamed of himself. He owes the people of Haiti and all of mankind an apology. Joining us now, Republican Congressman from Arizona, Andy Biggs. Uh, great to have you with us tonight, Congressman. Good to be with you, Shannon. Do you want to weigh in on where we are in this conversation? Well, I think it's very interesting uh, that we're getting some mixed messages of what took place in that meeting. I think that's, that's very interesting. 
uh, for one thing. And then the second thing that the Democrats are already preparing a, a motion, a resolution of censure to go with the resolution of impeachment that they already had, to go with the, uh, the Russian uh, investigation that they wanted and now it's kind of gone against them. To, all the way back to the day he was elected, they've been wanting to uh, delegitimize this mm -hmm. president. And I don't, I don't think that this, this uh, really helps the president or the Democrats. The only people who believe them anymore are their own base, I think. Well, and uh, Representative Al Green, the one who's brought the impeachment articles before, says this, congressional condemnation of racist bigotry is not enough. In Congress, talk is cheap. It's how we vote that counts. Next week, I will again bring a resolution to impeach real Donald Trump. I will put my vote where my mouth is. Hashtag repeal and replace Trump. They've done this before. I believe it was about 58 Democrats who voted to move forward. Uh, many others, though, in the party are saying this is not a good look for us. They don't want to be running on this idea of impeachment. Uh, do you think he's just going to continue to bring this up for a vote and we're going to keep watching it not proceed, but get enough votes to get some attention? Yeah, I think so. I think this is what they're trying to do. And I think it's going to backfire on them because uh, what we're seeing is, is where the Republicans deliver with President Trump and the economy and things that are going that way. If all you've got is the racist card and uh, delegitimizing President Trump, you're not going to win over those independents that went President Trump's way and helped carry him to victory last year. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me, but that's, that's where they are. All right, you've written a piece because now we got to talk about the substance of trying to get a deal yeah. done. Um, government funding runs out a week from tonight at midnight, uh, and of course the Democrats are saying DACA has to be tied to that. You have written a piece and said basically until the wall is funded, started, and finished, we should not be talking about any kind of legal status for anybody who's here illegally. Are you going to be able to hold that line? Because it sounds like the president is pushing forward and something's going to have to get done in one form or fashion. Well, I'm going to hold that line for sure because that's what I promised my voters. That's what my voters want. That's what they expect. I, I received messages today about that op-ed uh, supporting that position. And, and quite frankly, we've, we've danced this dance before. In 1986, we had an amnesty and what happened? We were promised all si kinds of uh, border security, internal enforcement. Didn't happen. Happened again when we, pr when we were going to build a wall. We built a wall, provided funding, and then the funding dried up. So these are, these are some real problems that we've seen before. And uh, so I, I'm so mistrustful, I think, that we keep our promise first and then not give up our leverage until, until we've built that wall. Okay, here's what the president says about the deal he was presented with. He says, the so-called bipartisan DACA deal presented yesterday to myself and a group of Republican senators and congressmen was a big step backwards. Wall was not properly funded. Chain and lottery were made worse and USA would be forced to take large numbers of people from high crime countries. Um, yeah, I have a White House insider who told me they just didn't consider the proposal serious at all. And it sounds like it, it if anything, uh, upset the president and, and maybe, who knows, provoked some of the, the rough language. Uh, but it doesn't seem like he believed that those uh, leaders came to him in good faith with a legitimate deal. Right, and I, and I agree with that. Um, when I read the aspects of the proposal that were released, it was like a, a, a token for the fence, and, and, then, and then they get everything they want. This, this looks like that old Gang of Eight bill that we, that we heard so much about derogatorily, uh, by the way. And I, I think that this and, and the, the Durbin report and all that, I, I hope it's instructive to the president that maybe some of these people that are negotiating from the other side aren't really there in good faith. I think that they're there trying to make their political point, and they don't really want DACA. They want the DREAM Act. That's what they want. They're calling it DACA, but they want a, a, a path to citizenship, a path to amnesty, and that's, that's part of the problem. Let me ask you about the more immediate concern, which is government funding, which runs out next Friday night, um, not too long from when the show goes off the air. What is going to happen? Because the Democrats are saying, listen, we let you go in December without insisting on DACA or any kind of protections for those individuals. Uh, we're not going to do it this time. I mean, will the government shut down over DACA? I don't believe the government's going to shut down over DACA. I think that you're going to see, uh, hopefully, military funding, defense funding for the rest of the year, and uh, we're going to take care of some of the the additional funding that needs to go there. But I don't think it's going to. You're going to see a government shut down over DACA. All right. Well, we'll be here next Friday night. Uh, feel free to join us. Hopefully, <laughs> you will have worked out a solution on both sides of the aisle for this uh, before we get to that point. Congressman Andy Biggs, great to have you with us. Good to be with you, Shannon. Thank you. All right, condemnations are pouring in tonight from overseas as well, including from nations dependent on U.S. foreign aid, like Botswana. 
Since 2004, Botswana has received more than $750 million in AIDS relief, for example, because it has the third highest incidence of the disease in the world. Now, in response to President Donald Trump's comments about the Botswana government, uh, they actually, the government, summoned our ambassador, Earl Miller, to, quote, express its displeasure at the alleged utterances, end quote. Well, despite the AIDS crisis, Botswana has a lot to be proud of. It's ranked as one of the Africa's freest economies and is considered the continent's least corrupt. It wanted our ambassador to clarify whether President Trump considered Botswana a blank hole. That said, not everybody in Africa disagrees with the president. 30-year-old sociologist from the West African nation, Guinea, says this, President Donald Trump is absolutely right when you have heads of state who mess with the constitutions to perpetuate their power, when you have rebel factions that kill children, disembowel women, and who, mut and who mutilate innocent civilians. Well, before he was asked whether he was racist by one of the White House press pool, as Gary Tenney just reported, the president signed a measure creating a new National Historic Park for civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. in Georgia. Today we celebrate Dr. King for standing up for the self-evident truth Americans hold so dear that no matter what the color of our skin or the place of our birth, we are all created equal by God. Let's bring in radio host Vince Colonies, who is the editorial director for The Daily Caller, and The Five co-host Juan Williams. Great to have you both with us tonight. Nice to be here. All right, so a lot of people looked at that exact line from the president today saying, you have dignity, you're a child of God no matter where you're born or who you are. Um, Juan, does that clean up the mess? Uh, not even close. I mean, the, it, the problem is it's not like something just spilled on our desk and we say, hey, we got to clean this up. This is a deluge, and I think you see it in terms of the fact that there's international condemnation, United Nations condemnation. So there's something larger here at work, and I think it speaks to the political problem in the short term is just damage to the president and his standing. But it's also damage, as you've been pointing out uh, throughout the night, Shannon, in terms of his ability to get a deal uh, that would avoid a government shutdown next Friday. Yeah, because, Vince, a lot of people think this gives the left cover now to say, well, we don't need to negotiate with this guy. We couldn't get a deal done because he's just not rational and he's a racist. Yes, and I think his detractors love that. Yeah. I, think, I think there are a lot of people who are rushing to accuse him of racism because they can weaponize it. It's, it's, it's valuable to them. Look, remember where this week began. The president has this bipartisan meeting with lawmakers. Mm -hmm. He says, bring me anything and I'll sign it. Well, it turns out that's not the case. They bring him something. He looks at it and he's frustrated by it. He expresses that frustration. And then American lawmakers who are in that meeting with him leak the conversation. It's a conversation in which they're trying to have a negotiation. This has hurt America's standing in the world. The president... Has, it makes a comment, yes, and he should be held responsible for that. But so, too, should the lawmakers who are leaking it out of that a conversation. If they want to confront the president, they should do it one-on-one. -on -one. But making this something that we litigate in public and therefore have to answer to other countries, it's unbelievable. And I think everyone in the room had a responsibility to behave in a different manner. Yeah, and as uh, we talked about, you talked about he had that successful meeting that it was televised, it was bipartisan, they were talking about immigration, and even mainstream media reaction coming out of that was like, whoa, this seems like a guy who is in control of things. He's not like the Michael Wolf book, book at all. He's negotiating. He's got recall. He's not repeating himself, that kind of thing. Um, and he had some other good events. He had this dedication, as we said, of the special park marking the birthpla birthplace of Martin Luther King Jr. And, uh, and today also commemorating the holiday that we celebrate and remark. Now, we've heard from two members of King's family, and I think this is interesting. Um, we have from Dr. Alveda Kang, who our viewers will know very well, his niece, saying, now this is before the blank hole comment. She said, I believe that President Donald J John Trump is working very hard to make America great again, and he continues to demonstrate that he wants to do that for all Americans, so the question of racism just doesn't fit that profile to me. Now, today we hear from Martin Luther King III, this is after the comments, saying in the New York Daily News, when you make a statement like you made yesterday, the question is, do you even understand why we have a Martin Luther King holiday? Juan? Well, you know, the, I mean, you know, it's hard to take the, take the sting out of it, uh, but you just try to, you know, when I heard Vince say, you know, play the race card and that his opponents delight in this, I do think that the president brought a lot of this on himself with the comment. So that when you make comments in the Oval Office, uh, guess what? It's going to leak. And the idea is that when the White House was presented with the opportunity to say the president didn't say this yesterday, they didn't say that. In fact, it looked like he was saying, listen, this is the way people talk. And he thought that it would play well with his base. 
So far, I don't know how it's playing with the base. I don't, I don't know. Think I don't so. know if he thought that particular comment, which he denies saying that exact word, um, he admits there was some rough course language in there. Right. And again, I mean, the, the, there's people are also making the delineation, I think, to include the White House, that he's talking about the countries from which these people come from. And the idea that we're going to keep people in the United States that have temporary protective status or had it until recently. Uh, that come from countries who have such miserable conditions. And uh, that's an inelegant way of, of referencing that. Well, you see, the problem I had was, as I understand it, he was talking about the lottery. And he really is an opponent of the lottery. I think he'd like to do away with it. Yes. Um, well, he's made that clear. Right. Yeah. And, and in the discussion about the lottery, you had the Democrats coming in and say, well, let's cut the lottery in half, but let's have special protections from people from especially or particularly distressed countries such as these, and then his response was, why do we need people coming from these asshole countries? But it's those the people part of it that's so offensive. But those people specifically are the people who already had temporary protected status in the United States. They were looking to extend the slots from those diversity visa lotteries to people already residing in the United States. Uh, so these wouldn't be people who are immigrating to the United States from these countries. They're already here, mm -hmm. and he doesn't want to see those slots go to those people. All right, we've got to leave it there. We could continue this conversation for a while. Um, Juan <laughs> yeah, Vince, definitely. great to see both of you on this Friday night. <laughs> Happy guys. Friday, Shane. Yeah, Take care. Too. All right, just last week, the Justice Department and the FBI barely beat a deadline set by the House Intelligence Committee to hand over documents and witness lists uh, related to the Russia investigation and that so-called dirty dossier. Well, tonight we've got some breaking news concerning the contents of those documents courtesy of our own Ed Henry, who's been doing some deep digging for us on this story. Good evening, Ed. Shannon, good to see you. Fox has learned that in two closed-door meetings this week, House Intel Chairman Devin Nunes told Republican colleagues there is evidence that shows clear abuse, that's the word he used, abuse of government surveillance programs by FBI and Justice Department officials. That's according to three sources familiar with those conversations. This is raising more questions about whether that anti-Trump dossier was used by the Obama administration to authorize surveillance of advisors to President Trump. Nunes, the California Republican, made these comments as he tried to round up votes in favor of renewing a key section of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, known as Section 702, that eventually passed in the House on Thursday. That part of the law gives the government power to get access to emails, calls of foreigners outside the U.S. who may be plotting terror. And Nunes says there has not been abuse of that section of the law. But he said other sections of the law have been misused by government officials to conduct surveillance of Americans. A clear reference to allegations that at the end of President Obama's administration, top officials at the James Comey-led FBI and Loretta Lynch-led Justice Department authorized surveillance of Trump officials. Nunez's comments came after he and other leaders in Congress were given access last week to sensitive documents in a secure room at the Justice Department, raising questions about whether those documents show that the dossier paid in part, of course, by the DNC and the Clinton camp, was used to grant permission to surveil Trump officials. Nunes, I'm told, is now pushing to get these documents in the hands of all 435 members of the House. But the top Democrat on the Intel Committee, Adam Schiff, will try to block that. He has said Nunes is acting as a proxy for the White House, and this is just an effort to shift the focus to the dossier and away from allegations of Russian collusion in the 2016 campaign. Meanwhile tonight, the conservative group Judicial Watch has won another lawsuit. This one is key. A federal judge ruling that by January 18th, the FBI has to give up the Comey memos, those memos that James Comey wrote about one of his meetings with the president before he was fired. Now, remember, Comey has admitted he gave those memos to a professor, a friend, so he could leak them to the media. Allies of the president have said that was improper and resulted in special counsel Robert Mueller being named in the first place. This is not the last we've heard. It's just heating up, Shannon. Absolutely. Uh Great, uh, interesting new insights there. Ed, thank you very much. Good to see you. All right, despite the tough week politically for the president, the economy is showing more increased strength. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is nearing 26,000. Strategists say there are numerous reasons for the optimism in the market, one of which is strong consumer spending, which makes up for about two-thirds of the U.S. economic power. This past December was the strongest holiday season in seven years. Retailers said they had high hopes, but the results were even better than their wildest expectations. Now consider that in light of this. The IRS and the Treasury Department just releasing their new withholding tables for the new tax law. And they estimate that 90% of workers are likely to see more take-home pay as soon as next month. Well, Russian President Vladimir Putin praising North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. We're going to tell you what he said about the rogue leader. Plus, the president is talking tough with Iran. Would he really walk away from the Obama-era nuclear deal? 
General Jack Keane joins us on that one after the break. And soon we can see more of those texts from an FBI agent kicked off the Russia investigation. We're going to dig deeper into what that could mean for the Mueller investigation. Russian President Vladimir Putin says he believes North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has outwitted President Trump in the standoff over North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Putin told Russian's top media figures Kim Jong-un is a mature leader who wants to ease tensions, adding he is, quote, absolutely competent and already a mature politician. Well, President Trump wants more nuclear missiles and more flexibility in how they can be used. That's according to leaked documents obtained by the Huffington Post. Now, that's sure to enrage lawmakers who have already held hearings over whether he's fit to control the current nuclear arsenal. Speaking of nuclear ambitions, the Trump administration's waiving sanctions on Iran, thus keeping President Obama's nuclear deal in place for now. Congress says it wants to improve the existing deal. Is that possible? Should it be scrapped? No better than to ask than General Jack Keane, retired four-star general and a Fox News senior strategic analyst. Great to have you with us, General. Great to be here. First of all, before we get to the serious stuff, I got to ask you about that Putin comment about Kim Jong-un. What do you make of that? Putin is a master at psychological warfare. I think he got inside uh, President George W. Bush's head, who I admire quite a bit. I think he manipulated President Obama. And he's manipulating Trump. He knows, you know, he's got an ego and all the rest of it. Uh, Kim Jong-un is not manipulating Donald Trump nor his national security team at all. They are so clear-eyed about where he's coming from and what he's doing in the sense that the three previous presidents before him were not. Okay, so we hear today that the president is not going to waive sanctions, but he says, this is it. I'm not kidding around. If we don't have major changes to this agreement, uh, this is not going to happen the next time. So he's made that stand. Now we hear from House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi this. She says, attempts to unilaterally alter this historic multilateral agreement will destroy America's leverage, credibility, and ability to hold Iran accountable for its dangerous, destabilizing activities in the region and its many human rights violations against its citizens. She doesn't like what the president is threatening or suggesting. Well, it, it, you know, it, it, it's astounding she makes a statement like that because we're almost three years into the deal, Shannon. And what has happened? The Iranians are running the civil war in Syria. Four generals have been killed. They're totally in charge. They brought the Russians into the war. They started the civil war in Yemen with the Houthis. They punched into Lebanon and the Hezbollah 160,000 rockets and missiles now. They are so aggressive in the region since the deal. Mm -hmm. And the deal was supposed to legitimize them with the other big powers of the world, give them the credibility of the deal, and therefore change their malign behavior. As a result of the $100 billion windfall that they've got, their malign behavior has increased. So what the, speak, uh, the former Speaker Pelosi is saying just makes no sense whatsoever. Iran is on the march in the Middle East, and they're building ballistic missiles. And the only reason why they're building those is because they want to put nuclear weapons eventually on them. So today we had a top leader from Germany flanked by um, some folks from the UK and France saying that they're going to try to hold this deal together. They think that's the best course of action. What happens if the president decides to pull out? Do you think he will? Well, I think what he's trying to do, I talked to a very high government official today who's clearly in the know. And he said, look, the president is trying to get the Congress to make some changes to the deal. And here's what they're really focused on. Number one, the so-called sunset closes, which permits Iran to have a nuclear threshold capability, short of a weapon, in 10 years, and in 15 years, an actual nuclear weapon. The deal permits that. Stop that from happening. Hold them in place right now and make that hold in place permanent. Second, permit a very tough inspection regime that now currently denies us from the more sophisticated military bases where nuclear research is going on. Makes no sense whatsoever, but that's what the Obama administration gave into. If we just get those two things to fix the deal, I think President Trump will go along with it because now we got something that makes some sense. If we don't get that, he's probably going to walk away. All right. So we talked about this leaked report from the Pentagon uh, looking at our nuclear capabilities, what we would like to add to the arsenal, what the flexibility would be with that. Um, it, it talked about a couple of new things that would arm subs with different nuclear options uh, as far as missiles. And we had a reaction from a former uh, 
Obama administration official who worked with President Obama, John Wolfsthal. Here's what he said about these reports. I think the document really goes off the rails by calling for the development of not one but two new types of nuclear weapons uh, that would be deployed both on submarines and on surface ships. Quick reaction from you on that. Well, first of all, we have permitted our strategic nuclear weapons to atrophy except for what we have on the submarines. And this is bombers and this is particularly intercontinent ballistic missiles. The Chinese and the Russians have been upgrading those for years. We have been unwilling to put the money on that, as we've been unwilling to put the money on a lot of other things in the Department of Defense. Our adversaries is what is prompting this. Actually, the Russians are, are nuclear-tipping cruise missiles, and they can, they're squeezing through an INF treaty to be able to do something like that. So we have no choice but also to lower the technology in terms of the kind of carriers for nuclear missiles and do the same as to hold them in check. And it also, it, it, it's a dangerous situation because the, the, the more nuclear weapons you have at the lowest tactical level as opposed to the strategic level that are dealing with cities, the more likelihood they could be used. So it is a dangerous situation, but I think the United States doesn't have much choice in the direction it's moving. In. But to keep up with uh, the others out there. Yeah. All right, General, great to see you. Hope you have a great oh, weekend. Oh, happy Friday, Shannon. Yeah, you too. All right, you may not think that heading up a federal agency is incredibly dangerous. It sounds kind of boring to most folks, but there is a growing list of Trump administration officials now under heavy security protection after growing threats. Who's behind them? And what do you get when you cross a bomb cyclone with a Norwegian cruise liner? Night courts, of course. Keep it here for the debate. Tensions rising in immigration protests tonight in New York City. Uh, police there making arrests after protesters tried to block an ambulance because it was carrying, they thought, one of their activists to another ICE office. He was about to be detained by Immigration and Customs Enforcement. New York City lawmakers were arrested in the mayhem as well. The councilmen and about 300 protesters were trying to protect activist Ravi Ragbar. He has been ordered deported back to his native Trinidad. It, that happened in 2006 following convictions for wire fraud and conspiracy, but he has stayed in the U.S. by challenging that ruling. Well, Scott Pruitt is the controversial administrator of the EPA who sued the agency 13 times before he was tapped to lead it by President Trump and now finds himself at the center of more agency drama. Trace Gallagher has that story. Trace. Shannon, as the current head of the Environmental Protection Agency and former Oklahoma Attorney General, Scott Pruitt has built his career by challenging what he calls the EPA's activist agenda. He's made no bones about wanting to cut regulations, but he apparently has made some enemies. And his critics now say that Pruitt's level of personal security is unprecedented. They also bemoan the fact that while President Trump is threatening to slash EPA funding and eliminate jobs, the bill for Pruitt's round-the-clock security could run into the millions, and that agents protecting Pruitt are being pulled away from investigating other environmental crimes. But the reason Scott Pruitt is getting more security is because he's getting more threats. According to the EPA Assistant Inspector General, Pruitt is getting four to five times as many threats than his predecessors. Threats issued through social media, as well as letters and packages delivered to his home. Scott Pruitt himself told Bloomberg, quoting, the quantity and the volume, as well as the type of threats, are different. What's really disappointing to me, as it's not just me, but my family as well. And the Free Beacon is now reporting that one of these death threats came from a man who was drinking and got riled up watching the Rachel Maddow show on MSNBC. The unidentified individual reportedly admitted sending threatening tweets to both Scott Pruitt and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. The threats were apparently serious enough to get the Tulsa Police Department, FBI, and the Joint Terrorism Task Force involved. Their findings were presented to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arkansas, which declined to prosecute. And the EPA Inspector General is looking into the cost of Scott Pruitt's security detail to make sure it complies with oversight regulations. And if you think it's unusual that the head of the EPA is getting threats, Ajit Pai, the head of the FCC, is also getting death threats for opposing net neutrality and fighting for a free and open Internet. Shannon. All right, Trace Gallagher, thank you very much.
The chair of the House Intelligence Committee says he has seen evidence of abuse of government surveillance programs by the FBI. And President Trump accuses an FBI agent of committing treason. That's next. And later when night court convenes, passengers on a Norwegian cruise consider legal action after their ship sailed right into the bomb cyclone, the massive winter storm. Our legal eagles will break down the arguments. You heard it here first a short while ago. Fox News chief national correspondent Ed Henry reporting tonight that House Intelligence Chairman Devin Nunes told colleagues he has seen evidence of abuse by the FBI regarding government surveillance programs. Was that a reference to the so-called dirty dossier? And was that used by the Obama administration to authorize surveillance of the president's advisors during the 2016 election? Let's try to unpack it with Sidney Powell, the author of License to Lie and a senior policy advisor to America First Policies. And Sarah Westwood, the White House correspondent at the Washington Examiner. Great to have you both with us tonight. Thank you, Shannon. All right, I want to put a couple of things out there for folks to consider. In Ed's article that he wrote tonight, he says, House Intelligence Chairman Devin Nunes told Republican colleagues in two closed-door meetings this week he has seen evidence that shows clear abuse of government surveillance programs by FBI and Justice Department officials. So now folks are asking whether that's maybe connected to this. Byron York's article in the Washington Examiner saying, sources on both Capitol Hill and in the executive branch have confirmed that representatives of four committees, the House Intelligence Committee, Senate Intel, House Judiciary, and Senate Judiciary, have had the opportunity to examine FISA documents in a secure room at the Justice Department. Thus, they know the answer to the, was the dossier used for spying question. Sarah, we have no way to know if they're linked, but what do you think? Well, exactly. We have no way to know whether the dossier was used to obtain these FISA warrants because there hasn't been a lot said publicly about how those warrants were obtained. And there was the release this week by a Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee of a transcript from the, the owner of the firm that ultimately compiled this dossier. And it became a Roar's cart test of sorts, right? There were mm -hmm. Republicans who looked at this and said the timeline fits with this dossier having been used to jumpstart the Russia investigation at the FBI. And there were liberals who looked at this and said, look how credible the FBI found the allegations in the dossier. There's a good reason why this was used. It was corroborated by George Papadopoulos at the time, and it was clearly uh, evidence of potentially something going on with Russia. So we still don't know how large the, the dossier factored into the FBI's decision making, but it's certainly a, a good question because remember that this dossier was at the end of the day funded by Democrats and the Hillary Clinton campaign. And, and Sydney, as the entire investigation continues, whether it's on Capitol Hill or Robert Mueller, um, there's somebody that folks should know about. His name is Michael Horowitz. Who is he? He is the inspector general for the Department of Justice. Mr. Horowitz has been investigating the page stroke text message problem, the leak problem from DOJ and FBI. A lot of that is interrelated with the Steele dossier and Fusion GPS. And I, if you look at my Twitter feed at Sydney Powell One, you can see that apparently a thousands of additional pages of documents have been produced by Department of Justice tonight to the House Judiciary Committee. So the House members are going to have a lot more to look at and we should be getting a lot more information in the future. But there is a substantial correlation, I have no doubt, between the Steele dossier and the FISA applications. And the FISA court itself has issued an opinion that everyone should read, thanks to Judicial Watch finding it, mm -hmm. that they have recognized abuses in the procedure. I think Admiral Rogers even reported it, self-reported, when he discovered it. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt that there have been gross abuses of the surveillance practices late in the Obama administration and the unmasking and the use of about queries, as they call them, mm -hmm. to find out things that they should never have found out about Americans. I want to get quick response from both of you because um, we have this, you know, Peter Strzok, who his text messages were uncovered. The president referred to him as committing treason. His uh, lawyer is following back saying it's beyond reckless for the president of the United States to use that language. I'll get quick reaction from both of you, Sarah, first. Well, I think it's a double-edged sword for President Trump to wade into this territory. On the one hand, him talking about it forces the media to cover it because they have to cover everything that he says. But on the other hand, he might undermine the credibility of the DOJ Inspector General investigation by turning this into a partisan football. So he has to be careful how much he weaponizes this before all the facts have come out. Sydney. 
The president is reflecting what the general public perceives and understands when they hear this sort of information. When you have FBI agents coordinating and effectively conspiring to commit a coup and uh, oust the existing president through putting together evidence to support an impeachment process or trying to impede his election in the first place. That's just a common sense reaction to that. That may not be the statute that applies. I would rather look at 18 U.S.C. section 1512B, which is a corruption of justice, obstruction of justice, mm -hmm. misleading and deception. But there's a problem there. Well, and we know that uh, Devin Nunes is saying he wants to make sure that all 435 members of the House can see what he's seen. Uh, and once that happens, you know there will be leaks because that's how Capitol well, Hill works. Well, the public works. needs to see it, too. The yeah. taxpayers need to see it. And I'm sure he's going to work to that end as well. Sydney and Sarah, thank you both very much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a storm of controversy. Passengers making waves over holiday cruise, and they say caused a bruising. You decide who's at fault tonight coming up in night court. And just what the doctor ordered, President Trump gets physical. We've got the results just ahead. Time for Night Court. We pass no judgment on these stories, but present them to you, the jury, for your consideration. On the docket, Bombo Genesis and a boat called the Breakaway. The Norwegian cruise line ship is safe tonight, but not after what some passengers are calling a trip to hell. It began last week when the crew made the decision to return to New York from the Bahamas right through the path of that massive winter storm that barreled up the East Coast. Oh boy, many passengers said they were seasick for several days. They actually feared for their lives. The cruise line issued a statement that reads in part, quote, we sincerely apologize to our guests for the stronger than expected weather conditions and any resulting discomfort or inconvenience they may have experienced. But the National Weather Service began issuing advisories on hurricane force winds associated with the storm three days before. Some passengers are now threatening a lawsuit. So did the breakaway break any laws? Joining us now, Will Bruzo, a former JAG lawyer who is now a criminal defense attorney, and Lisa Garber, an attorney who specializes in privacy issues. Welcome to you both. Good Thank evening, you. Shannon. Okay, so we're hearing from one of these passengers, Christina Menendez, or Mendez, who says um, that it really was a total nightmare. She had kids with her. Nobody would tell them what was going on. She says this, they did not care for our safety, for the disabled, for the elderly, for the kids on that boat. I want them to apologize, and I want them to think about how they're going to do better next time. Um, Will, they've gotten an apology letter and a $500 voucher for their next cruise, so does that take care of it? You know, I, I don't think so. Here's, here's the problem. This wasn't just like bad weather. This was something they call bomb genesis, where basically you have a 24 millibar drop in atmospheric pressure over a 24 hour period. It's a very extreme storm condition. And they knew about it several days before, they, before the boat left. So this is something they knew they were gonna have extreme weather, rolling huge waves, and that people were gonna get sick. When you take a cruise, it's just not going from point A to point B. It's also the journey. So they reasonably should have known that it was going to be a very, very rough trip, and people were not only not going to enjoy it, but it was going to be very difficult to get through, and in fact, mm -hmm. it was. Okay, so this is a little bit of what we heard from Weather.com. A meteorologist there said forecast guidance depicted that a powerful and large low-pressure system would develop over the western Atlantic Ocean many days in advance of January 3rd to 4th. Given the forecast intensity of that low, powerful winds and high surf were given in the offshore waters of the U.S. East Coast. So, Lisa, what kind of obligation did the uh, cruise company have? Well, obviously, this is an unfortunate situation, but also, obviously, when you're traveling by ship on the ocean, you may encounter bad weather. And part of the guest ticket contract, which is the contract that binds the passengers on Norwegian cruises, states you acknowledge that there may be conditions that are outside of the captain's control, outside of the ship's management's control. For any cruise line, there is continuous legal precedent that states there is no implied warranty of safe passage, meaning they are not guaranteeing safe passage. Wow. Okay. Well, I don't think a lot of people can realize that when they get on a cruise ship. Well, well Certainly. here's the thing, but, but, but that's not the case in the event that they know that there's going to be extreme weather. If they know there's going to be extreme and very unusually extreme weather, which is the case here, and it could possibly endanger the passengers, if not at least make the voyage miserable, I think they have obligation to do the right thing, which is either delay the cruise or tell people, 
about the extreme weather. So this wasn't something that wasn't under their control. They knew it was coming, and that's the difference. If they had no idea, then I would agree with her. But, but they knew it was coming, and they went ahead and did the cruise anyway. We learned later that the reason they did this is because they had to make it back for another 14-day cruise well, uh, you know, on the return trip. All right, final, well, we, final word to you, Lisa. Well, we don't know that for sure. And, of course, the captain, Norwegian cruises are not going to want to put passengers in danger. There is no positive side, no positive way to spin that. But there were conflicting weather reports. The weather changes. That's just a fact of life. This is something we've known for a very long time. And, unfortunately,